I should have given you time to ask questions, but I will not because there's an important part of the scripture of the passage. And it's very important for us to understand what the Word of God teaches and how the believer is to respond whenever we have challenges that human understanding cannot solve. A teacher in the adult section uh, spoke about the wisdom of Rahab. He applied that wisdom of Rahab to wanting to get saved, which is right, which is true. And so she had a covenant with the people, the spies, and then eventually got saved and she stopped there. In the youth section, the teacher was forthright and clear. The teacher emphasized in the youth section that God knows how to protect his people. And that God did not need the lie or deception of Rahab to protect the spies. In that way, in the youth section, they cleared it up. You understand that God is mighty. Actually, when you look at um, Joshua chapter 6, don't open, I'll just tell you, you know the story already, that in taking Jericho, which is this city we're studying about, they had to shoot anything, drive anything, dig anything. They just walked around, and then eventually the walls came down flat. And they didn't say the Rahab. All the other walls fell down, but by God's mighty power, he preserved the wall on which the house of Rahab was. And so you see the divine orchestration of the whole thing. And then if you think about the young prophet that Rehoboam said, take him. He wanted to take him, his hand dried up. He couldn't pull the hand back. God has power to be able to do whatever he wants to do. And then you remember 185,000 uh, soldiers of Sennacherib. How God sent one angel and destroyed all of them in one night. And God could have done any of those things, remember Joshua, on the battlefield. How the sun was taught and the moon was taught. God could perform a miracle like that. And then you remember how Daniel was thrown into the lion's den. And the lions couldn't touch them. And then you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. How they were in the furnace of fire. And the fire could not burn them. So, we understand that God can protect his people without having to go into what the people of the world do. And uh, even though our teacher in the adult section mentioned the wisdom of Rahab, and he applied the wisdom to seeking salvation, the minds of uh, the hearers will generally go back to a lie and count that as wisdom. And we're planning business, we're trying to move forward, we're, you know, trying to get this and get this in life. And when you remember the lies of Rahab and the wisdom of Rahab too, then you're likely to say, I can manage myself this way and that way and do this and do that after all. Rahab was saved. Of course she was saved. And um, so I can do this. But ask yourself, what saved Rahab? If you look at the New Testament, it says by faith Rahab was saved, not by the lie. If you look at James, it says God honored the work that he did, that she did. That is the work of faith. Because faith without works is dead. And then James did not refer to the lie. It referred to the protection. You see, God looked at Rahab as a Gentile, an Amorite. And because she was an Amorite, that's what she knew. She had no Bible. She had never read the Ten Commandments. She didn't have the law. She didn't have the church. She didn't have 
the system of the religious training or bringing of the Israelites. She didn't have any teaching. She didn't have any book of righteousness. She didn't have any law. She was without God, without law. And without the covenant and the commonwealth of Israel. And in her own sinfulness, as well as in her own gentle behavior. And in her own lifestyle, all she knew to protect these people, that was before her salvation. And so you cannot use that if you are now a believer and see what Rahab did before salvation and then continue to do that after salvation. You have the Bible now, you have Genesis Revelation, and so you cannot say the wisdom of Rahab is going to be your own wisdom. And then you are going to tell lies, and then you understand that in the case of Rahab, understand, Rahab was changing allegiance. Rahab was under the king of Jericho. But now, she was uh, coming out of that allegiance, and she was going to give a loyalty and allegiance to Israel. And so you will see that she didn't any lie to the spies, because she said, I'm going to be loyal to you. I'm responsible to you now. I'm, I'm, my allegiance is to you now. But I, she felt in her own gentle behavior, she could lie to the king because I'm not under you anymore. I'm already going to plant my lot with the people of Israel. And so now, come back to this. If your allegiance is to your husband, you cannot say I'm copying Rehab and tell lies to your husband. If your allegiance is to your wife, you cannot you know, tell lies to your wife and say I'm using the wisdom of Rehab because now, your allegiance is now to your wife, to your husband. If your allegiance is to Christ, you cannot tell him lies. If your allegiance is to your pastor in the church, you cannot say this is Rehab. You see, Rehab, she understood what she was doing. Her allegiance was no more to the king of Jericho. And she said, I have nothing to do with you anymore. I'm putting my Lord with the people of Israel. And she didn't tell any lies to the people she had allegiance to. Not only that, Rahab told a lie before salvation. And then some people use that as excuse to tell lies after salvation. Not only that, Rahab told one lie. Only one lie recorded in her lifetime before salvation. And then there are people that tell lies. Uh, they tell one lie in a month, that's 12, uh, in a, maybe one lie in a week, and that's 50, more than 50 in a year. And then you know, they go through that all their lives, and they say, I'm following Rahab. You're not following Rahab. She told really one lie in her gentle condition. Then you now continue that and multiply that. You make your, yours a habit. And in the case of Rehab, not at all. I'm going to, you know, think about uh, the wisdom of Rehab now, which is the wisdom of the world, really. Because if you look at um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 21. For after, for after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. The world by their wisdom, you're not God. There are many kinds of wisdom, and the wisdom of Rahab in telling the lie and protecting those spies is the wisdom of the world. Before she came to know the Lord, and by wisdom she knew not God. It wasn't, a, you know, that kind of carnal wisdom, worldly wisdom that made her to be saved. It was her faith. By faith, Rahab. Not sage. That's Hebrews 11, verse 31. And then you look at chapter 2 of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. How be it will speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world. That's the wisdom of the world. And if you are not of the world anymore, you are born again, you are not of, you are not like Rahab before salvation. You cannot have that, that kind of wisdom, because it says over here, yet the wisdom, not the wisdom of this world, and not of the princes of the world that come to naught in your business transactions. If you cover up on your taxes, if you cover up on your returns, 
He will cover up on your negotiations with people, even with the church, when maybe the church is buying something through your company. And then you tell your boys or, you know, your workers, officers there, do it this way, do it this way, do it this way. And then one of the people will challenge, how oh, can we do that? Oh, then you say, let's be wise. If you are not wise, you're not going to make it in life. So let's be wise. That's the wisdom of the world. And that, the one that leads us to lying, to deception, actually is going to land us in hell. We're looking at verse 13. Chapter 2, verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. It says, we who are now preachers, and we who are pastors and apostles, and we who are leaders in the church, we speak. But we don't speak in the words which man's wisdom teaches. It says, it goes on there in that verse, I think, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Let's go look at James. In James, we're looking at chapter 3, verse 15. James, chapter 3, reading from verse 15. This wisdom descended not from above. You see, there is a wisdom from beneath, a wisdom from the pit, a wisdom from the gentle nations, a wisdom from the kind of, uh, you know, literature books we have read in the past. A kind of wisdom that, you know, we get from the villages. The kind of wisdom we get from all the people that are clever, clever and crafty. And able to deceive. And you're not no head from tail. And then you get into trouble and they get into trouble too. This wisdom descended not from above. But his earthly, sensual, devilish. It says in verse 17, for the wisdom which is from above is first pure and truthful and it says then peaceable and gentle is it to be treated full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy the wisdom from above does not have hypocrisy in it and uh, so let's uh, let's come back to joshua i'm looking at joshua chapter 2 just short of the two. Now that we understand that the wisdom of the world is not uh, going to help us spiritually, aren't you? Now look at Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go, view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an Harlot's house named Rehab and lodged there. The question is, why should good people, righteous people, Israelites, dependable, trustworthy people, go into a Harlot's house? They didn't go there to mess up their lives. They knew that that's where the people, that's where they normally come. Everybody comes there. Well, everybody of their own kind of people. And if you're going to have information, that's where you have free flow of free information. That's where you can eavesdrop and hear what this one is saying, what that one is saying. And they went to examine the land. And we are going to have all the information needed about the country where you have loose talk, free talking. And on strange speech, that's where they went. That's the reason they went there to start with. And they were told in verse 2. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in the hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. Well, it shows that those people that were going to such it, even though they had free talk and free conversation, all that there, they were vigilant too. And somebody out of that place saw those two spies, and they immediately reported to the king. Look at our country at this time, and look at the situation of security and insecurity that we face. 
And sometimes you might know that, you know, in your local church or in your congregation, whatever it is, you see a strange object. And then you just pass. We don't do that. Because of the situation in which they were, they were very vigilant and immediately they didn't just gossip among themselves. Did you see those two spies? Did you see did you see this? Immediately they went to the right source, the person that could actually control things, and they went to tell him we should be security conscious so that if you see anything that is strange or anything that could be harmful, immediately don't just take things for granted. Whatever saw this before this is strange. You talk about it and then look at it in verse 3. And the king of Jericho said unto Rahab. The king of Jericho did not say, don't worry about that. What are your credentials uh, by the way? You are telling me this. I want to know you. Get the information immediately quick. And then there's a good time to act when you have an information like that. And you act immediately. And the king acted immediately. That's what you'll be learning here. That if you have an information that, you know, there's a strange person, a strange object uh, there, before they are there to do much evil in your, in your church, in your local church, in the congregation, or in the church at large, you report that. You know, you are hearing that that one has an evil spirit and is choosing his... Uh, you know, whatever it is to manipulate people and destroy people and scatter people and destroy families. Well, I'm not going to allow them to hear that from me. Why not? And you hear that there's somebody that is, you know, doing a prostitution in your local church. And then she's uh, like Jezebel, deceiving this and deceiving that. And, uh, you know, the trusted men already, they are getting into, you know, this kind of thing. And you know it. I'm not going to talk about that because you know, they won't hear from you. Why not? They heard from these people. If you are for the protection of the church, the protection of the kingdom, the protection of the king, you're going to talk about that so that the king then, once you're giving the information to the king, you give the information to your coordinator, to your pastor, to the group coordinator, the group pastor, then it's in their hand to do whatever they want with the information they have. And then it goes on, it says, uh, the king immediately said to Rehab, bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they become to search out all the country. You know, the king, uh, that's a responsibility, we're to protect the flock, we're to protect the people under our care. And whatever information we hear is to help us, to aid us in doing our work and protecting the people we ought to protect and therefore he said they have come to spar the land they are going to destroy the country and she didn't know the allegiance of Rahab but she was he was doing his duty do your duty now verse 4 and the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus there came men unto me but I wot not whence they were is that true or false? Is that truth or a lie? Tell me out loud. Can we do that? Should we do that? Give me a good no. Now we go to verse 5. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate when it was dark that the men went out whither they went I know not. Is that true? That's not true. It's a lie. Where are they gone? I don't know. Pursue after them quickly. But ye shall overtake them. And you know, she sounded believable. She said, I'm also for the protection of our, of our country, of our city. They came really. I can't tell you they didn't come. They came. But they've gone. And where they have gone, I, cannot, I wish I could tell you. But Pursue them very quickly, and you'll be able to catch them. All that you know, there are people that tell you lies, and what they tell you lies, and they even try to propose some kind of solution to the problem you're trying to solve. And because of that, it sounds believable. And then you doubt yourself. Oh, I thought the spies were there. Yes, you are right, they're there. But now she said they have gone. No, they have not gone. It just will make you believe a lie. And we're looking at verse 6. But she had brought them up to the top of the house, to the roof of the house. 
and hid them with the stalks of the flax which she had uh, laid in order upon the roof and the men pursued after them what may, how many kinds of works do we do on the basis of a lie? How many pursuits do we have? How much of the race do we run? Just pursuing a lie. Because she had told them a lie. And the king believed that. And when a leader believes lies, he'll give out responsibilities and tell you, go and do that, go and do that, go and do that. On the basis of the lie, he believes. And there you are running helter skelter, you are doing, you are using all your skill, all your ability, doing something that is not necessary. That's all a lie. And all the time Rahab knew that you are wasting you are wasting your time, you're wasting your life, you're wasting your resources and your skill, pursuing because she had told you they have gone, pursue them, and truly, truly you are pursuing them. What are you pursuing? On what basis? On what grounds? For what reason? Who gave you the information that made you to take a decision and now you are pursuing something? You need to think about your life. Otherwise, life will be a life of pursuit, a pursuit that never yields any result. And there are some people that will know, at least Rehab will know that that's not going to yield the result because what you are pursuing and looking for is on her roof. And then she sent you to the mountain. To climb the mountain, to descend the valley, and to search here and there, and try to find out. And it's saying to you on all these errors that are based on lying. Check up your life. That's why we need the gifts of the Spirit to be able to tell that this is the way to go. Let's look at uh, verse 7. And since the men pursued after them the way of Jordan unto the forts and as soon as they were as they, they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gates. They shut the gates. But you know, what will that do? They thought now we're taking security measures, shut the gates. We're going to comb the whole land. So wherever they are, we'll be able to push them out. No, you can't, because the only place where, she, where they are, you need to ask her, all right, we hear the story you have told. You can just stay aside and search the house and search the roof and search everywhere. What if they had done that? Well, God still knows how to protect those two spies. Don't worry about them. God had given the land to the people. And there's nothing that Rahab or any other person could do or the king that will hinder them. But because of the situation we find ourselves in a leadership, and because of the situation we are in the country right now, I'm going to take, you know, still some time and talk to you on the danger of believing a lie. The danger of believing a lie. You see, that's what the king believed. It was a lie. And that's uh, the reason why she sent all those people out. It was a lie. Because she actually believed it. The danger of believing a lie. And if you're a pastor, you believe lies. Some people tell you, you're not going to leave the church aright. If you are a king, if you are a president, you are a governor, you are a leader, you are a director. And we believe the lies the people tell us. We're not going to make it in our leadership. That's why it's important for us to understand believing in lie. Now, lie, if you check up in your thesaurus, that is, uh, that's a book that will give you sin on it. It will give you this, number one, lying, number two, deception, number three, flattery, number four, duplicity, double dealing. You say one thing, actually this is what you mean, but this is what you say, double dealing, duplicity. And then there's also, there's crocodile tears. You thought that was kind of, you know, our local, a local uh, language. No, it's not a local language. It's, you know, you find in dictionary, crocodile tears. And it's uh, connected with lying. We check out. Then there's hypocrisy, then there's deception. Number one is the danger of believing a lie. I'm looking at First Kings chapter 13. First Kings chapter 13, I read from verse 18. First Kings chapter 13, verse 18, he said unto him, I am a prophet also as thou art. 
And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back up into thine house, and that he may eat bread and drink water. Tell me the rest of that verse. But a light unto him. And the prophet, great man of God, believed the lie. Look at verse 19. So he went back with him and did eat bread in the house and drank water. Look at verse 24. And when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him. And his carcass was cast in the way. And the ass stood by each, and the lion also stood by the carcass. He died. Why? Because he believed a lie. Number two is deception. Second Samuel chapter 15. Second Samuel chapter 15. Leaders ought to watch. And leaders ought to examine the things you hear. It appears believable. Is this one a lie? Is this one the wisdom of Rahab? Check out. In Second Samuel chapter 15, I'm reading there from verse 7. And it came to pass after 40 years that Absalom said unto the king, I pray thee, let me go and pay my vow. That sounds religious. That looks like what David was expecting. My son has changed. My son is now going to worship God. My son now has a vow. Let me go and pay my vow, which I have vowed unto the Lord in Hebron. For thy servant, uh-uh, Absalom, great servant, the servant of David the king, for thy servant vowed a vow, while I abode at Geshem. In Syria, saying, If the Lord shall bring me again, indeed, to Jerusalem, then I will serve the Lord. And the king said, Go in peace. And he arose and went to Hebron. But, uh, but Absalom sent out, sent spies throughout all, this, all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then he shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. You see that? David believed the lie. They could have captured him. He could have to get rid of this boy, a murderer, a deceiver, an injurious person, undependable, untrustworthy son, and apply the word of God against that unprofitable, unworthy son. But he did not. He believed a lie. You know the result. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, And David said unto all his servants that were with him, At Jerusalem, arise and let us flee. The person who killed Goliath is now fleeing and running away from Absalom. It started with believing a lie. Number three is flattery. You see people flatter and lie. And when, those, when the lie comes to you, it's coming from on the platter, on the plate of lying. Psalm 78. In Psalm 78, I'm reading from verse 36. Psalm 78, verse 36. Nevertheless, they did flatter with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongues. Flattery. They flatter with their mouth and then they lie with their tongue. That's how the Antichrist is going to get, you know, the people of the world after the rapture, after we're gone. Look at Daniel and you'll see that he's still flattering. He's going to get the people of the world. I'm looking at Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11, verse 21. In Daniel 11 verse 21, and he shall, and in his estate shall he stand up, he shall stand up a vile person to whom he shall not give the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come peaceably and obtain the kingdom by what? 
by flatteries and will actually destroy quite a lot of people because of that flattery. Look at chapter 8 of Daniel. Chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 25. And through his policy also shall he cause craft to prosper. Deception to prosper through the flattery. And then he goes on to say, He shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall do what? How can people destroy others by peace? That's deception. I tell you, they want to destroy, but they look peaceful, sheepish. They're like the lion, but a lion's inside. Their wolves covered up or sheep skin. And so they look peaceful, but actually they're planning to deceive and destroy. But patiently destroy many. Now, duplicity, double dealing. If you remember Jezebel, she was the wife of Ahab. Ahab wanted the uh, vineyard of Nebot. And Nebot said, God forbid, I will not give my possession, my inheritance to any person. And then Ahab did not know what to do. She, he was sad. And Jezebel said, you are king. What's the matter with you? Why are you sad? And then, um, you know, he said, because I want a neighbor's beard to not be given to me. And uh, you know the king, just go and eat. I will give you what? Neighbor's beard. And then she wrote a letter to the elders of the city of Nabal and said, let's play a game over here. Duplicity, double dealing, promote the man, exalt the man, celebrate the man. Let him think that we're celebrating him. But after that, bring two men and let them testify that he blasphemed God and the king. On the basis of blasphemy, God and the king stoned him to death. And that's what he did. And then they reported back, we played the game. Don't you think that everybody trying to promote you, exalt you, and they hover around you? Oh, we love you. We appreciate you. We accept you. And then we're promoting you. In that promotion, what's their mind? There's duplicity. Please understand. You are living in the world, and some of those people in the world that are not born again, they are just there, and they are trying to play their games. That's why when you study a passage like this, you examine everything. Am I believing a lie? Another one, number five, is falsehood. I'm looking at Proverbs chapter 26, verse 25. Proverbs chapter 26, we're looking at verse 25, falsehood, and it's to destroy. It says in chapter 26, verse 25, When he speaketh fear, smooth talk, when he, the disabled, when he, the liar, when he, the one that is not born again and is just trying to, you know, place you there on the pedestal, it says, When he speaketh fear, believe him not, for there are seven, what? Abominations in his heart. That's why you want to be careful that the uh, people of the world don't catch you. When you speak of fear, can I show you something in the word of God? Second Samuel now, chapter 3. Chapter 19, rather. Second Samuel, chapter 19. The reason we're giving all these scriptures is so that we can learn from them. The wise, real wisdom. I don't believe in lies so that you don't destroy your life. Don't die prematurely. Second Samuel chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 13. Second Samuel 19 verse 13. And say ye to Amasa, Art thou not of my bone and of my flesh? But do so to me. And more also, if thou, Amasa, be not captain of post before me continually in the room, in the place of who? Tell me out loud. Joah. 
David discovered a better person, a more trustworthy person. Somebody you can depend upon. And then he voiced it out. Sometimes we leaders should be very careful what we say and how we say it and when we say it and to who we say it. He said, ah, Master, I, I appreciate you so much. Ah, that, that is, uh, you know, captain of my course. His name is Joab. He's been doing some things of late that I think I want to replace him. And you showed up. I'm going to replace Joab with, what's his name? Tell me. The new captain, Amasa. And Amasa too felt kind of elated. This is great. And then, you know, David was proud. Right? When he comes, I'm going to give him that office. I give him this. I give him this. Because Joab finished. Look at chapter 20. In chapter 20, I'm reading from verse 9. Don't you believe a lie? Don't believe in all this duplicity of people. Chapter 20, verse 9. And Joab said unto who? Art thou in health, my brother? You know, Joab, Joab pretended, oh, I love you. I see that you are going to have this new position. I don't care. I don't mind. You are my brother. Are you in health? Are you healthy enough to take this position? And Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to, to do what? To kiss him. Hey, you know, we appreciate you. They, whoever the king appreciates, who will not appreciate such a person? And kissed him. And here now was Amasa. He was just left his guard. Look at verse 10. But Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand. So he smote him therewith in the fifth ring and shed out his bowels to the ground and struck him not again. And he, he did what? He died. The new captain, where is he? Now his dead is in the grave. You see, that's what we are saying, that if you don't understand human nature and you don't understand how people operate, you believe every word, you are too simplistic. We we'll call them simpletons. We we'll become so believing that you just believe everything everybody says. And yet they want to get rid of you. That's the reason we want to understand in this situation. Well, you need to actually be security conscious that you understand. You just don't believe everything that everybody says. Now I want to come to number six, which is crocodile tears. Have you heard those words before? Tell me out loud. Yes, you heard. You heard somebody is saying something. And then you're saying, is it true? Oh, and the fellow broke down, crying. Why is it you will not believe me? And I want the, the fellow is crying, and then you give up and say, I'm so sorry to hurt you, I'm so sorry. I believe you, please don't cry again. And you are the one now trying to plead with the person, don't cry. Hey, there are crocodile tears, be careful. In the land in which we live, it's not everybody that cries, that's actually crying. Some people can act. And they can act out that cry. I'm looking at Jeremiah chapter 41. Jeremiah chapter 41. This is real wisdom. The word of God gives us wisdom. So that you are not sucking to everything that everybody is doing or saying. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 41, verse 6. And Ishmael, the son of Nesaniah, went forth from Mispay to meet them. What was he doing? Weeping all along as he went. And it came, and it came to pass as he met them. He said unto them, Come to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam. And it was so when they came into the midst of the city, that Ishmael, this man that was crying and weeping, crocodile tears in verse 6, that Ishmael, the son of Nathaniah, slew them and cast them in the midst of the pit, he and the men that were with him. You see that? Well, you think you are safe because the fellow is crying, weeping, those crocodile tears. And it's all deception. 
That's why you want to be very watchful. And then there's hypocrisy, a kind of hypocrisy that you know, it appears that people don't have any conscience anymore. Their consciences are seared with a hot iron. I'm looking at First uh, Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. First Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, when? I said when? Latter times. When is latter times? Now. The time we're living now. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. They were in the faith before. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy. They speak lies. It's all hypocritical. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. I don't have any conscience. They'll speak it and look at you, eyeball to eyeball, and they look believable, audacious, very sure of themselves. I mean, you look for all the signs you are looking for, and somebody is telling you a lie. They don't have any of those signs. It says they speak lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, when somebody believes a lie, I've told you, I spoke to you on the danger of believing a lie. In these last days, what's the danger? Look at um, chapter 2 of Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Don't have the wisdom of the world. Don't you ever refer to any kind of hypocrisy or duplicity or covering up as the wisdom of Rehab. Don't deceive yourself. And don't deceive your church too. You want your church to keep on standing in righteousness so we can keep, keep on giving you the word, the word of truth that saves and sanctifies. It says, with all deceivableness of unrighteous, unrighteousness in them that do what? that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them, what? Strong delusion to do what? That they should believe a lie. It's a delusion. If you believe a lie, you know, you are so simplistic. A simple term. Believe everything everybody says. Every time. Whoever they are. It says that they might all be damned, in verse uh, 12, that they all are the damned who believe not the truth, but add pleasure in unrighteousness. That's what the Lord has warned us today. We're taking good time, but it's very useful and necessary, so that we'll be warned in the life of which you live, so that your family will be protected in Jesus' name. Your local church will be protected in Jesus' name. And our church at large, our church at large will be protected in Jesus' name. And when in leadership, your leader, the general superintendent, is saying, this person, let him stay aside, step aside. And then you go to the fellow, and the fellow cries and weeps her heart out, and he says, I don't know what I've done. I don't know why. They put me aside like this. And then you now begin to go around and to say, we don't know what's happening. There should be love. Love. With truth. Not just love. There should be tenderness. Tenderness with who? And then because of all their lies, you are ganging around and you are saying, we don't accept this. I mean, who will tell us that this sister is not sincere? Look at her weeping her heart out. Don't say that you don't understand. Who will say that this young man is not sincere? And they have questioned him, questioned him, and he said he doesn't know anything about this. Look at him even crying. A young man like this broken down, and yet the leadership will not even budge. We understand. Don't put your hand there. Just keep on serving the Lord and praying for us. Are you not praying for us? And God is answering your prayer, and that's why we say, hey, that one, keep that one, keep your lies, but stay aside. Then, you know God is answering your prayer, and when we get to heaven, you'll say, praise the Lord, he gave us a leader like that. Are we all right? God bless you. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Don't believe a lie. There are many lies flying around. 
Don't believe that. Talk to the Lord in prayer that God will help you. First of all, repent of any kind of the wisdom of Rahab. Your place of work, covering up lies, changing receipts, be fraudulent. They'll say you're applying wisdom. That's the love of money, which is the root of all evil. And the Lord is saying, I've not found your life perfect before me. Repent. And then we carry that into the church. That's difficult to know who to believe, what to believe, when to believe. And they say, I did it with wisdom. The wisdom of this world, which will come to naught. The wisdom that is devilish. The wisdom that leads to hell. The wisdom that covers up unrighteousness. Pray that God will help you so that now you are truthful. You are honest, you are transparent. And if you have a tendency to love, love, love people without ever thinking, the people could be deceptive. And then your life runs into danger. Because you believe every word of every man and every woman, every time, everywhere. Pray that God will make you more cautious, careful, watchful, slow in taking in people into your family, slow in taking in people into the ministry. Pray that God will give you discernment, watchfulness, carefulness. Don't allow people to suck you in into their lies. And don't spread other people's lies for them. Don't let them transfer the lies to you. And then you take that lie to tell another. Take that lie, tell another. Spread that lie until multitudes are deceived and believe in a lie. Pray that God will deliver you and save you. So liars will not corrupt your lie. Destroy your life and drag you to hell. All these years you have believed on the Lord. So far, so good. Take heed, the watchful.